So uh, we are covering the master's first lectures from the principle of happiness. And now this, this time is the ninth time. So we are covering the master's lecture on the principle of self-reflection today. Okay, uh, this lecture is given the conscious, Shakamuni consciousness uh, from the start. Usually, must, uh, guiding spirit is enter master, Rihoka's body, uh, after a few uh, comment then, but but uh, this lecture is from the beginning, the Shakyamuni consciousness was together with Master Ryoka himself. Okay, uh, I departed, uh, I parted this lecture into two parts. Now we'll watch first part, around 30 minutes or so. Sound well, doesn't October come. of 1988 oh. has started. Oh. Just as it says on the banner in front, our movement began with a spiritual message series. And already one million copies have been sold. This number will soon grow to 2, 5, and 10 million copies and create a surge that will reach all over Japan. Now, in the flow of the growing number of books or the diverse laws, whereabouts are you swimming or drifting? Have you managed to successfully swim through it? I suspect many of you haven't been able to evaluate your situation. However, I want to emphasize that now is the most important time. For you to establish yourself. That is because we are starting to see potential growth. So now we must pull ourselves together again. Reflect deeply on ourselves and establish ourselves to grow and progress further. In my book, The Essence of Buddha, I have revealed exactly what the thoughts of Shakyamuni Buddha were, who lived in India about 2,600 years ago in a way that is easy to understand. I condensed his thoughts into a framework that forms the very essence of Buddhism. No matter how many Buddhist scriptures you read, if you cannot understand the thoughts described in The Essence of Buddha, you have not truly grasped Buddhism. In other words, in that book, all of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings he gave during his 81 years of life are condensed into the framework of his thoughts. At some point, I do plan to write a book on his life in detail.
But I decided to first publish the essence or the framework of his thoughts and clarify it. So what did Buddha want to teach? If I were to condense it further to a single statement, it is understand the meaning of self-reflection. You may wonder why. What is self-reflection for? Do we practice it just because that is the right thing to do? Or does the act of self-reflection itself have some significant meaning? Is there a more profound significance that we are not aware of? You may ask yourself these questions. Because I've been born with a destiny to see what people cannot see. Hear what people cannot hear and know things people usually do not know. I must teach you a very important fact. Although you may think you are in control of your life, and in charge of more than 99% of your thoughts and actions. This is not necessarily the case. In the world that is invisible to your eyes, various phenomena occur. Moreover, people's happiness or unhappiness is mostly influenced by spiritual beings. The majority of the global population of about 5 billion people today is unaware that they are under the influence of spiritual beings. This is a very difficult fact for me to accept. You must awaken. You must understand that even if you think you are in control of your own life, you may actually be living like a puppet. Let me explain in detail. Most people I have met are under some kind of spiritual influence to some extent. But very few seem to be under the good influence or under the influence of their guardian and guiding spirits. Many people are under negative spiritual vibrations at certain times of the day. Although the duration and extent of this exposure differ from person to person, this phenomenon is common to all people. As children of God, indeed, this is a disgraceful sight for us. Human beings who are considered the lords of creation are often influenced by animal spirits or lost spirits in various ways. When I see humans allowing their lives to be manipulated, by the ill will of these spirits and falling into an abyss, 
I am all the more determined to eliminate these negative influences. I want each person to live every day thinking, I've lived today with my true self. Many of you are living lives you can hardly call your own. You're just accepting the results and bearing the responsibilities of life. And drifting in this destiny, but as children of God, children of Buddha, you need to awaken. Stop letting these negative influences mislead you. Wake up immediately to the awareness of being a child of God and shine your noble divine nature. The time has come. The way to do this is very simple. That is self-reflection, a method that has been repeatedly taught to people. Since 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, or even longer ago, more than 16,000 years ago, on an ancient continent called Mu, which has since disappeared without a trace, there was a person named Ra Mu. He taught people repeatedly. Get your true self back. To do so, break free from materialistic vibrations and calm your disturbed mind. I can see such visions of him in various forms with my mind's eye. Many high spirits have frequently come to this world to teach and guide people in various ways. However, throughout all of it, one teaching has always remained the same, unchanged and undistorted. You must correct the mistakes in your mind with your own will. That is when the great river of destiny will flow in the direction you are heading. As one of the methods, Shakyamuni Buddha taught the Eightfold Path. But Ramu's teachings were different. If compared to the Eightfold Path, his teaching could be called the Threefold Path. The first step in his Threefold Path was self-reflection on love. Ramu taught that you must live with love for others and reflect every day on whether you gave love to others. The second step of self-reflection was whether you were able to attune your mind to God. Or the guardian and guiding spirits who are close to God today. He said if you can't hear directly or indirectly the voice of your guardian and guiding spirits, it means your clouded mind is obstructing it. If you cannot tune your mind to the heavenly world, the cause lies in your thoughts and actions during the day. Therefore, you need to reflect on them. Ramu's third teaching was about reflecting on what you have learned today. 
Evaluate whether you have not wasted your day. Life is only a matter of decades. But it is not easy to be born in this world and into the environment and circumstances you are in now. Unless you have extremely good luck, you cannot be born in this age. So do not waste your life away. Do not waste this year. Do not waste this day. Ramu strongly emphasized this point. Learn from every experience. Do not go a day without learning, not even an hour, a minute, or a second. You may think the Eightfold Path is a definitive method of self-reflection. But self-reflection is the attitude of not wasting our given time. As long as you think this way, self-reflection can be practiced in infinite ways. I am now teaching the true Eightfold Path by reframing Shakyamuni's teachings using simple words in the modern context so that each of you knows his teachings. However, there are infinite methods to self-reflect, and I am yet to teach many other methods. These methods depend on whether you have awakened to your spirituality and to what degree. As a starting point, I would like to recommend Ramu's threefold path, which is much easier to practice than the eightfold path. The three criteria are relatively easy to practice. There are only three points. First, did you give love to others today? Human beings are natural givers of love. So if you don't, that is against your true nature. First, reflect on this. The second, in short, is to reflect on whether you had a peaceful mind. If you can't communicate with your guardian and guiding spirits, this means the vibrations of your mind are disturbed. So make efforts to calm the vibrations of your mind and be peaceful every day. And the third point is to reflect on what you have learned. This self-reflection is for you to build a more positive self. In the next monthly magazine you will get soon, I talked about self-reflection. Many people mistakenly think that self-reflection is simply the process of looking back to the past. But the true purpose of self-reflection is to correct your thoughts and actions and create a more constructive life. So it is not a passive practice. It's not only to cancel out the negatives. The true purpose of self-reflection is to develop a more positive self and realize God's will in the name of building utopia in this world. Under this purpose, the difference between self-reflection and prayer can be disregarded. We should not concentrate solely on the method and lose sight of the essence. We must wish to change our current selves for the better and take actions that produce more wonderful outcomes. The essence of self-reflection and prayer can be summarized into this single purpose. The three self-reflection methods 
I just talked about are very easy to practice. And I believe over 2,000 of you can immediately start practicing them. However, some complicated elements are involved in self-reflection. For example, you may not have experienced the effects of self-reflection. Very few people probably understand the power of self-reflection. Its power is remarkable. With my spiritual sight, I can see evil spirits or a cluster of thoughts possessing a person falling off. As soon as he or she starts self-reflecting, as if the ropes that were attached to them have been cut off. This is what I see. I want you to understand how powerful the act of self-reflection is. Now I must tell you a fact about divine light. You may think light is something we receive from the outside. Or is given to us by other power. You may think that the high spiritual beings bestow light and that you receive salvation through this light. This idea certainly contains some truth. In my book, From Love to Prayer, I have taught the different ways to pray and introduced many prayers. When you verbally recite the prayers, you become a spiritual source emitting spiritual energy or vibrations. And create a golden bridge to the higher spiritual world. In some cases, various guiding spirits give you power. You may experience this. However, I am giving the lecture on the principle of self reflection before the principle of prayer. Because I want to tell you that light does not always come from the outside. The essence of self-reflection that Shakyamuni Buddha taught is that light shines from within. People who have practiced meditation in our seminars may have experienced the full moon meditation a practice in which you visualize a full moon. Full moon meditation is not merely a meditation practice. It shows you the state that you can ultimately achieve when you thoroughly pursue self-reflection. I myself also practice self-reflection. When I look within myself and sink deep into my mind, I can see an image of myself. This image is not of my physical body. I see myself as a golden statue of Buddha. From within the lower abdomen of this golden statue, I can clearly see light being emitted. 
Full moon meditation actually shows you the completed form of self-reflection. When you practice self-reflection, you will examine your thoughts one by one. But if you don't see this shining self-image and a deep meditative state, your self-reflection is not complete. When your self-reflection is complete, your whole body will emit light, called an aura or a halo. However, this light is not just on the outside. With spiritual sight, your whole body should look like a golden statue. Moreover, it should disperse intense light in all directions from the inside. This is when I sense a different light other than the ones I experienced during prayer. The light during prayer comes from high above, whereas the light from self-reflection shines from within. Only when you see and know this will you truly understand the structure of the mind that I wrote about in The Exploration of the Mind and Others. In them, I explain that the structure of our mind is layered like an onion. In every human mind, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth dimensions exist in layers like an onion. You will ultimately come to know this truth through self-reflection. At the center of the human mind is the core that connects to the real world, and even to the world beyond where human souls live. The eighth or ninth dimension is said to be the highest dimension that human souls can go to. But a part within us receives light from the tenth and the eleventh dimension and even beyond. The deepest, most profound part of our mind is ultimately connected to God who exist in the deepest part of the great universe. When you become aware of this, it is important to know that there are ways to seek the light within. After all, this is what Shakyamuni Buddha mainly tried to teach. When the two great spiritual leaders, Jesus and Buddha, are compared, this point is exactly where a clear difference lies. Jesus knew that an absolute being who transcends him exists far beyond. He referred to this being as Father and also God. He knew that this transcendental existence is greater than his soul inside a body. And this was what he taught. This is the starting point of faith in other power. In contrast, Shakyamuni Buddha did not teach about other power because he did not consider human beings or the souls. That dwell in physical bodies as weak beings. In Jesus' teachings, human beings appear weak and fragile. And sometimes they are treated as sinners. So it is easy to imagine them as weak individuals. But in the eyes of Shakyamuni Buddha, 
Human beings were truly strong. He saw strength at their very core. Of course, he saw many people being washed away by the rough currents of destiny and being caught up in the vortex of karma. In this sense, Shakyamuni Buddha saw just as many fragile people as Jesus did. However, he discovered God's light at the core of every human being. This is why he did not intentionally teach faith. He didn't think faith was an act of revering to something far, but taught people to awaken to the light or the core within themselves. He taught that everything would be there and that they would see everything and be given all the power. He held a world view wherein the inner universe encompasses the outer universe. Only with such a perspective can faith gain more power. And transform itself into even greater energy. The inner self and the transcendental consciousness are not separate entities, but are spiritual energy passing through the same point. And sharing the same source, people who have fully grasped this fact can live life with much power, strength, and courage. In other words, instead of seeking help to escape from being weak, you need to realize you are not weak. God or Buddha is within you, and you must discover that. You must awaken to God or Buddha and manifest the Buddha nature that is within you. Buddhism can be summarized to this single point. If you cannot understand or acknowledge this single truth, you have not learned or understood Buddhism yet. To what extent can you discover this fire, this flame, this light? This is your challenge. Okay, this is the end of the first part. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I'm going to give a few uh, explanations on a few points. Firstly, Master mentioned about the book, uh, The Essence of Buddha, because this book, the first Japanese version, is published on the same day of this lecture. And this is very, very important book. It will be uh, one of the most important books in happy science. Uh, if you can, you must choose five important books in happy science. This might be included because this is a very structural book and explained all things about the Buddhism by Buddha himself. And uh, Master Okawa explained the conclusion of this book is understand the meaning of self reflection. This is the most important uh, conclusion of this book. Then Master Riho Okawa explained the important, how important the self reflection is. Uh, because uh, in current days, most of the people have been possessed by evil spirit. So they have become kind of a puppet. So they, are, uh, uh, they, may, uh, they may encounter many kinds of disease or conflict or accident. These are caused by the evil spirits. They don't know how they occur, but most, in most cases, they occurred in the uh, position. And uh, uh, in this lecture, Master started to talk very harshly or very strongly because, because at that time, the maybe attendant might be 1,000, 
most of the, them, happy science followers, was actually affected by evil spirits at that day. So uh, by speaking very strongly, he was actually clearing away the evil spirit, especially the half, half, uh, half, first part, half, first part of the lecture. He was very, he was talking very harshly, strongly. That's because he was growing the, uh, bringing away the evil spirits that was possessing the, the that were possessing the, the con, uh, uh, people who are attending there. Okay. So if you think you are kind of affected by evil spirit, or watching this video is very, very effective. Very, very effective. Okay. So this is a very important point. Uh, actually, many of, most of us are actually uh, possessed or are influenced by evil spirits. Then, by using self-reflection, practicing self-reflection, uh, we can eliminate, eliminate evil uh, thoughts, thoughts or influences. Uh, okay, uh, if they are not so strong, it is easily be eliminated. But it were actually uh, strong, very strong. It is very, uh, difficult to to uh, to take away in a just a small uh, just a, uh, in a second. It takes time, but uh, eventually it will kind of uh, eliminate the influential uh, uh ones. So it is very effective. Then. Awaken to the shining true self as a child of God. This is a very, very important, very, very important. This is the most important part of self-reflection. We are not animals. We are not just living in the body. We are, act we are really a true, truly a God, God child with brilliant of the mind. So we have to awaken the true self. Uh, this is the most important part of the self-reflection. And Master Liu Hoka told that uh, if uh, our self reflection were completed, we can see a kind of a, a full moon as our mind. Full moon meditation is like see our true self as a child of God, child of Buddha. So you can join self uh, uh, full moon meditation in happy science morning prayer session, or you can do it in by yourself. And uh, it was around two, two, two and 20 years ago. Before that, I was in uh, local temples in Japan, and then I was moved to head temple in Utsunomiya. And uh, uh, because of, you know, I was in Shoja, I practiced every day self-reflection. Maybe it was, a, I practiced a self-reflection every day, like uh, three months or more, and I thought, I thought my man, mind was cleared very much, and I practiced the fourth full moon meditation. And I saw my mind is like a kind of shining, shining. But, but I found many dark dots were on the surface of the moon. Oh, that dirty still. So it was very kind of shocking to me. So, but. The frugal meditation is like a check, checking of your mind. So we can practice just, not just for the relaxation, but for checking our uh, spiritual practice uh, development, like doing that. Okay. The Master Liu Hoka taught about a threefold path taught by Ramu. Threefold path. First is the self reflection of giving love to others. Then the self-reflection on attuning your mind to God or guardian uh, spirits in the heavenly world. Then self-reflection on what you learned today. These are the uh, Ramus three, uh, three, four paths. So it like it looks like very easy. You can practice uh, from today, very easy. Mm -hmm. You can remember that. Okay, and I. We will compare it to the to this uh, threefold path to the fourfold uh, first, uh, fourfold path. Okay. First one is love. It's about teaching of love. Second one is self-reflection. 
by self reflection we can attune we can remove that is of my mind and can attune our mind to the heavenly world to communicate to god or guardian spirits so the second one is self reflection then third one is about what you learn today what you learn today this is about wisdom what kind of wisdom do you acquire today also also did you did you uh, did you did your spiritual practice uh, have some kind of advance so progress today so this is also the teaching of progress the ramuth so as a conclusion ramuth three uh, four pass is correspond to the four four pass in this way this is my conclusion Hmm. You can forget about this. <laughs> Lastly, Master Liu Ho about uh, talked about that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha thought the humans are strong, strong, very strong existence. Okay, you may you may have read this book, uh, the not essential book, uh, the challenge of the mind. In this book, in the first chapter, a Master Oka taught uh, it's kind of advanced teaching that uh, religions are divided into two types. Divided into two types. One is religion that in integrate human with God. Religion that integrate human with God. So human are not separated with God, uh, separated from God. Human can come closer to God. Because he is a God, a child, God, child of God, so he has an innate power to come closer to God. The other is a region that isolates humans from God. In this region, in this kind of region, uh, humans are thought to be uh, weak and sinful. So uh, upper side is like a Buddhism is uh, Buddhism is in the upper side. And uh, Christianity is uh, maybe categorized in the lower ones. And the uh, upper side, the teaching is uh, mainly focusing on the self-effort to develop one's power. And the uh, second one is uh, uh, okay, uh, mainly uh, seeking salvation from uh, God, with faith in God. And uh, we have two, two types of religions. We can we can categorize many religions in this way, but here is Master Ryuho Oka's conclusion. Important conclusion is that uh, both both these types of religion demonstrate right thinking. Both means uh, like a religion that integrate humans and uh, God, a religion that uh, separate human and uh, human from God. Both types of religion demonstrate right thinking. But for my part, I attach greater importance to the idea that human beings have been gifted with a wonderful innate nature, which they can develop through their own effort. The reason I feel this way is that according to the religions that place their faith in the us in the outside power. Not much development can be expected from humanity. In the region that unites humans with God, on the other hand, there is an infinite path that opens before human beings, a path that leads to boundless progress and development to come closer to God. This is my, my own words. Uh, so comparing the two, two uh, if we compare two kinds of religions, uh, first one, the God, uh, uh, humans are strong uh, theory will be uh, more productive in the long run. In the long run, in the short run, in the short run, if someone is very a different, difficult situation, uh, they are seeking salvation from uh, God. It's a kind of a, a emergency. But after that, they should be thinking that we have a strong power so they can develop their own power so in the long run the Buddhism is greater than 
uh, Christianity like thinking. Okay. So we must find our own right, own power emanating from emanating from ourselves. That is a, a main thinking of Buddhism. Then we enter into the master's uh, second part of the lecture. When you look back and reflect upon your day, many thoughts may come to mind. Regarding the Eightfold Path, right view comes first. It is to check if you see things in the right manner. You may think this is a matter of course. But how many people actually check to see whether they are viewing things rightly? Right view has three checkpoints. The first is how you view the people around you. People's suffering often comes from interpersonal problems. So it is important to check if you saw others and their ways in the right manner. Did you see others in the same way God sees them? The second checkpoint is to assess how you see yourself. Were you easy on yourself today? Did you have a biased view of yourself? Were you overly lenient with yourself? Did you evaluate yourself rightly? Did you evaluate yourself in the same way God would have evaluated you? Or did you justify yourself based only on your own criteria? You must ask yourself these questions. The last checkpoint is to assess the troubles you have with others. Incidents and conflicts occur when people interact with each other. Did you see them rightly? Did you evaluate whether you observed the incidents? Or conflicts that involved you rightly? Right view includes these three perspectives. This is the meaning of right view. Only by reflecting on these checkpoints will the Buddha nature that was dormant within you gradually awaken. As you deepen your practice of right view, the image or idea that you had of others will gradually change. And you will begin to think differently. You will be able to see both the phenomenal self, Buddha nature manifest itself, and tell them apart. In front of me now are over 2,000 people. How I see these people and how you see them are clearly different. Can you pinpoint this difference? Do you know how I view each and every one of you? 
What I see is the light of God that lies within each of you. Your physical appearance, your skin, clothes, hair is not what I see. I see how much of your true nature as the child of God you are manifesting. I see the state of this light within you. That is what I see. Of course, I see your physical appearance with my eyes. But this does not mean much to me. Your physical appearance is just a fleeting image, like the images of a film that are projected onto a screen. It appears and disappears without leaving an impression. What I really want to see and truly want to know is the part of you that stays unchanged in the passing of time as you live your ever-changing life. In other words, I would like to see your Buddha nature. This is at the forefront of my mind when I interact with others. Another important point of the Eightfold Path is right speech. This is difficult to practice, but the easiest to identify for self-reflection. Speaking rightly is difficult. We cannot master this in just one or two years. Refining our words requires tremendous effort. But we must understand that human society is built on words. Self-reflection on right speech is not only about the words you speak with your mouth. It also includes written words. Right speech is essentially about any expression of the thoughts in your mind. So as written words also. Moreover, it includes your facial expression, which may speak your mind more eloquently than spoken words. Your face says more than your mouth. Your eyes speak too. Each look in your eyes or expression on your face reveals your feelings toward others. Some people are only concerned with what they have said, but even if the spoken words were appropriate, what about your facial expression? What did your eyes say? Please think about this. All body language is included in the self-reflection of right speech. Let me tell you what it essentially means. Ultimately, the real world is a world of thoughts. In the real world, thoughts and actions are not separate but are one and the same. Everything you think, good or bad, manifests immediately. In this world, however, your thoughts and the outcomes are not directly linked. Your words and actions lie between them. Only with their intervention can your thoughts be manifested. Therefore, you must first be aware of the words you use, the number of negative words. Typical spirits in hell can be identified by the words they use.
I can't stand seeing them. But the words they utter never wish for the happiness of others. Although they seem to be wishing for their own happiness, they do not realize that their words are clouding their divine nature. Words are mysterious indeed, but only a few things can tell us clearly whether we are living in accordance with God's will. If self-reflection is difficult, first reflect on your words and imagine what angels are like. There is no heaven where people harm each other. In other words, heaven is created with words. The numerous spirits in hell have no physical body. And exist as thought energy. If they want to change hell into heaven, they must correct their words. Then a heavenly world will immediately begin to appear. It's simple. However, hell exists, which means many people are unable to practice right speech. Right speech has no limits. This is also true for someone like me who is speaking to you. Ultimately, right speech must be filled with words of truth, words that possess the strongest and most refined spiritual power. Just because you didn't say anything harmful, you cannot think that you have completed self-reflection on right speech. You must examine how many words of truth you spoke during the day. You must reach this level of self-reflection. Many think the reflection is done if they didn't harm others. But this is not the end. How many words of truth did you convey to the people you met? Were you able to give nourishment to their souls and kindle a light in their hearts? Please know that this is how far your self-reflection must go. The Eightfold Path can be organized in many ways. But I would like to talk about right living next. I have explained it as living one's life rightly. The original meaning of right living is to live life to the fullest. What does that mean? It means to, at this time and in this space, manifest the original state of your soul while it resides in your physical body. This idea naturally leads us to live rightly. Even if you reflect on right living every day, right living cannot be completed. Looking back on the last 24 hours of your day, there may be things you feel you have done well. Then, if you are asked, could you live these 24 hours more in accordance with God's will? 
Could someone else who has more deeply awakened to the truth? Use those same hours more effectively? When you are asked these questions, you will realize that self-reflection on right living is never-ending. In terms of modern life, right living is how effectively you use your given time. However, as I have written in Starting from the Ordinary, Time here is not about relative time. It refers to absolute time. You are being evaluated by the time you spend living in absolute time within the 24 hours you have. Time has a different spiritual value for each one of us. 24 hours can be measured with a clock, and one hour may seem the same for everyone. But from the perspective of the truth, one hour may not merely be one hour. One hour may be worth one minute or one second to one person, while to another person it can be worth 1,000 or 2,000 years. For those who listen to one hour of Jesus' sermon, that one hour might be worth 2,000 years. This is absolute time. It's not just about listening to lectures. It is the amount of time you spend as your awakened self. Did you live the day as your awakened self? This is reflection on right living. Many of you may think you have lived your day efficiently and effectively. But do you live each day as if it were your last? Or as if it were 1,000 or 2,000 years? You will know how much more there is to self-reflection on right living. The next path in the Eightfold Path is right action. For those who have a job, this path may seem similar to right living. But right action asks whether you have ever reflected on work itself. Most people live their lives without much thought. They think they just happen to be working at their company after graduating from school. and will continue to work there until retirement. This is the norm in Japan. Have you ever thought about how much of your time in life you spend working? Most people spend a third or more of their lifetime working upon entering society. Are you satisfied with using your time merely to earn a living? I'm sure you're not. Are you working only to get paid? Isn't there a valuable meaning in building relationships with people at work? Suppose your life were to end today and you were to look back on your life. Wasn't there something you wanted to accomplish in your job? Isn't there a part of you who feels embarrassed? For not exerting yourself to the fullest at work. Don't you feel sad for not having worked with all your heart and soul? Your work is of great value in two respects. First, it is the starting point of building utopia.
Societies and various environments change through work. Second, work provides us with materials to attain higher enlightenment. Presents you with the opportunity to practice nurturing love of the developmental stages of love. Nurturing love cannot be manifested without a place to practice it. So we must appreciate the opportunity to raise our level of enlightenment through our work. Work serves as a place for us to deepen our enlightenment. There are infinite ways to nurture people. In the case of company presidents with tens of thousands of employees to look after, their progress is not limited to the number of employees. They have the potential to go beyond their company and influence people on a national or even a global level. With regard to enlightenment, nurturing love can expand its influence infinitely. This limitless potential allows you to increase the strength of your soul. And helps you become a person of greater caliber. Aside from spiritual levels, there is the soul's capacity to embrace other people. A person may not be highly enlightened, but have great capacity or generosity. Without practicing nurturing love on many different occasions, the capacity to embrace and guide many different people cannot be developed. I have so far explained the first four paths of the Eightfold Path, which are very important for those pursuing spiritual discipline. But for those seeking enlightenment and devoting themselves to self-discipline, right thought is crucial. Compared with the previously mentioned paths, Right view, right speech, right living, and right action, which are concrete practices that have a relatively easy starting point. Right thought is difficult to practice, and many people cannot reach this stage. To what extent are you able to explore the path of right thought will tell you whether you are genuinely seeking enlightenment. The mind is very interesting. It can appear like an image in a kaleidoscope and also like a bubble. It's ever-changing and also a single point wherein the great universe lies. The ever-changing nature of the mind prompts us to realize that the true purpose of reincarnation throughout eternity is to fully understand right thought. We repeatedly reincarnate throughout eternity because the spiritual assignment of exploring right thought is never-ending. 
I published so many books on the truth to provide material to help you pursue right thought. This material conveys the truth. Unless you study this truth, you will never truly understand right thought. The human mind is multifaceted, but to us it appears two-dimensional like a flat surface. To see the mind's multifaceted structure, studying the truth is essential, as it allows us to examine the world within our minds from every angle. That is why I publish books of truth one after another. The path of right effort enhances and supports your practice of right thought, allowing you to make further progress. Right effort means to make an effort on the right path or in the right direction. Although there is no hierarchy among human beings, if I were to categorize them in two groups, one would be facing God and the other in the opposite direction. As a starting point, it is necessary to turn toward the direction of God. This is the first step toward happiness. This is your first step, direction, and aim. If you make a mistake here, your efforts will all be wasted, no matter how hard you try. So face the right direction and go forward one step at a time. This is right effort. Here I would like to clarify that. You must aim to discover enlightenment to practice right effort. If not, it is not right effort. The spiritual level and environment for enlightenment are different for everyone. The right effort is impossible without the aspiration to discover enlightenment. Remember this. To this end, strong will, courage, a sense of purpose, and energy are essential. Even if you are living rightly every day, are you not living like a plant? Do you have ideals or a sense of purpose and not living like floating duckweeds? Is that okay? You must be strongly rooted, growing straight up to the sky to heaven. This is what right effort is all about. Please do not get this wrong. However nicely you may be drifting in a pure environment, this is absolutely not our true life purpose. You cannot just drift every day in a pure environment. It's not just about the pure mind. Aim for greater, grow like a giant tree. You must do so. If not, you can't say you are a child of God and you have Buddha nature. And right will and right meditation are the last two paths. From here, the spiritual discipline enters a professional level. After mastering right will and right meditation, you will reach the first stage of the awakened one or become an arhat. At this level, a halo will appear around your head. And you can receive messages from your guardian spirits. You will also be able to give light to others. To reach this first stage of enlightenment, right will and right meditation are indispensable. Right will is not just thoughts and ideas that come and go every day. Instead, it is the direction of a will that is projected far into the future. 
In fact, the power of will and right will works. Like a locomotive engine that pulls right effort forward. The will here does not simply mean drawing up a plan for one's future. It includes the thoughts directed toward our guardian and guiding spirits, or what we call prayer. Thoughts that are transmitted with a specific purpose are called will. Accordingly, right will also includes prayers to God and high spirits, prayers to correct yourself, and also prayers of thanks. Also, prayers to offer gratitude for the great blessings of having been given life, and prayers toward a wonderful future vision. Numerous such thoughts are transmitted from our minds. Therefore, we can conclude while we live in this three-dimensional world, we are also beings who transcend this third dimension. Humans are existences that encompass the multi-dimensional world within. So you must realize that right will is the way to transcend this third dimension by transmitting will in all directions and building a bridge from this world to the real world. It's a way for us to move closer to God. For this reason, right will is there as a way to transcend this three-dimensional world. The final path is right meditation or meditating rightly. There are many kinds of meditation. One is where you self-reflect in meditation and you clear every cloud in your mind. Another is, as I've taught you before, where you just meditate. Or it's also a state where you are connected to the world of high spirits through prayer. Through right meditation, we can experience emancipation. While still living in this world, when we experience a spiritual state where our minds no longer belong to this world, this is when we can go beyond the restrictions of our bodies and materials and build ourselves as an existence of the higher dimensions. This is the goal of self-reflection that we must seek. Self-reflection is a way to discover your true self as a child of God. And to live in such a state in this world. I would like all of you to discover the wonderful self within you. Discover the self that is connected to the higher dimensions. Self-reflection includes this kind of creative endeavor. I have discussed the fundamental ideas of self-reflection from various angles. There's one last thing I want to say. Without self-reflection, enlightenment is impossible. 
悟りは絶対にないということを断言しこの This is my conclusion. Thank you. させていただきたいと思いますありがとうございました Jay, you couldn't hear me. Sorry very much. Okay. Firstly, I l l explain the order of the Eightfold Path. It is related to the teaching between the relationship between、uh, developmental stage love and Eightfold Path. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Second thing I want to、uh, tell you today is、uh, not about、uh, each process of Eightfold Path, but about the overall, overall concept of teaching. The teaching. Okay. Uh, okay. The difference between traditional eight w o r l d f a s t and the true eight w o r l d f a s t passed t o s t by Master r i h o k a El Cantare. If you look at the traditional eight w o r l d f a s t by taught by Shakamri Buddha, much of the teaching was、uh, were, were, have a focus on eliminating evil thought and deed. Most of the teaching were focusing on the,、uh, eliminating evil thing first. That is the main focus of the traditional one. And、uh, compared to that, the master's teaching is put more focus on elevate your thought and deed, actions, to come closer to God's will or to become、uh, one with God, or Buddha.、Uh, okay, both include both, both,、uh, both the different、uh, it will pass,、uh, contains、uh, these two factors. but、uh, Focus is different. Focus is different.、Mm. Such, as, such as here,、uh, right thought. In the traditional e d f o r d path is to eliminate six worldly delusions such as greed, anger, ignorance, conceit, doubt, and the false view. These are the focus of the、uh, right view in the uh, uh, traditional, traditional one. And compared to that, okay, Master Li Ho Ka taught us that the、uh, human mind. Is like a multifaceted, which is like a diamond. So we must, we must、uh, okay, develop each faucet in the mind too, like a, like a diamond. So we must have a love, wisdom, or self reflection, also a strong will, or courage, or endurance.、Uh, we should develop many, many faucets in our mind. That is the teaching of、uh, Master Li Hokawa in this、uh, rage. So we must、uh, okay, learn many teachings, not just, not just eliminating, eliminating the evil thing, but also elevate our thought to, to, to higher level. This is Master teaching. Then, about the right action. In traditional, traditional Buddhism, he, he teaches do not kill. Do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not speak falsely, and do not drink. These are the main teachings. But in the Master's new teaching, so first we must work well. It is a contribution to creating a utopia on Earth. Also, secondly, the work provides us the material to attain higher enlightenment, such as wisdom or nurturing love. To subordinate, or sometimes we need courage to make a good job. So, the, this kind of thing is quite different from the original、uh, Buddhism.、Okay. Then, right will. Right will is a way for us to transcend、uh, these third dimensions by transmitting will in all directions and building a bridge from this world to the real world. And it is a way for us to move closer to God. It is a way to move closer to God. Then, right meditation. Okay. <laughs> right meditation.、Uh, only through this experience, through this experience,、uh, right meditation, can we move beyond the restriction of our physical bodies and three dimensional. 
materials and build our true selves as an existence of a higher dimensions. This is a goal of self-reflection that we must seek. So as you can see from these explanations, uh, focus is quite different from the traditional Buddhism. And as a final conclusion, self-reflection is a way to dis, uh, discover your true self as a child of God and to live in such a state in this world. Uh, I, would like to, I would like all of you to discover the wonderful self within you, the self that is connected to the higher dimensions. So this is a, this is a purpose, a conclusion of the self-reflection. So we, through the self-reflection, we can connect ourselves to higher self, which resides in the higher dimensional world. And uh, we have another teaching from this book uh, through a uh, true eightfold path about self-reflection. Uh, self-reflection is associated with the, true, the fact that uh, you were given eternal life by God. Self-reflection is associated with the fact that you were given eternal life by God. The fact that you live an eternal life provides you with the perspective of looking at the present uh, from the distant past and from the far into the future. The fact that you live an eternal life provides you with a perspective of looking, look, looking at the present from the distant past and from the far into the future. So, uh, in this book, it walked the eight four, through eight four pass. Master said that reflection, self reflection is to look at your present self from the far, far future, far distant future, and also far distant past. Through this, uh, through these two kinds of uh, uh, position, you can see yourself. That is the self reflection. Master explained, a bit difficult. <laughs> like, uh, Okay, let me explain like the, using some kind of illustration. This is the eternal true self that extends from the eternal past to the eternal future. We have eternal life, self, have self. And sometimes we come to this world for decades or uh, if it, it become longer, uh, 100 years, or a temporary self, we can reside in a body having a life in on earth. But sometimes, in most cases, we don't know about true self. It answers. We are kind of detached from true self. We don't know about that. We don't know about that. <laughs> the self reflection is a kind of a method to uh, connect ourselves to eternal self. So by through, by practicing self reflection, we can connect ourselves to the eternal self, self. So while we are living on this world, we can live as an eternal life existence and think about ourselves, think about the future, think about the past. Uh, that is a, that is a, a, a kind of a mm, goal of uh, self reflection It is very, very difficult. We can experience we can we may explain ex experience these kind of thing mm, in some some way or another in a small small possibility but sometimes we can see that kind of situation uh, if you are we are if we are a kind of a lucky enough lucky enough uh, through practice of the uh, repeat practice of self reflection so this is our goal so we should practice self reflection repeatedly repeatedly Okay. Then, the last conclusion. Massa said, I conclude this lecture with an important message. Without self-reflection, enlightenment is impossible. Very, very clear message. So, without self-reflection, uh, we cannot have enlightenment. So, we must practice uh, self-reflection. Uh, you must have deal before, but we must practice continuously do that. The one of the uh, 
uh, method that we can do self-reflection is the master's uh, teaching. Uh, like this one is a CD book, CD and a booklet of the self-reflection, a practical method of self-reflection. It consists of three kinds of self-reflection. It helps us very much. So we can practice, we may practice this self-reflection every day, uh, if possible. Okay. I did it uh, practice uh, every day while I was in the Sohonzan, Shoshinkan. Yeah, almost every day I did. Yeah. Okay. I, ex I, I uh, urge you to practice this too. Okay. This is the end of today's session. And the next session uh, is on the December 10th. Uh, it is anniversary day. Uh, day before the anniversary of the inauguration of the Australia Shoshinkan. Also, we have a special me meeting for next year's activities. We uh, our focus on the next year will be spreading the laws of the sun. It is a most basic book of science. So it is will be a very crucial uh, uh, action, uh, activities. So please gather next time and join together and talk together. Thank you very much for your joining, coming and online. Thank you very much.